I started feeding raw 10 years ago. And at the time it was becoming complicated, but it really wasn't that. There were still plenty of people that were just, just give your dog the food, they'll be fine. Whereas today we have meal formulators, we have software programs, we have spreadsheets. So many people are afraid to feed raw or afraid of getting it wrong. And um, and I feel like that is not where our founders and people who started getting us to think this way, this is not what someone like you wanted the diet to turn into. So what are your thoughts on what we're doing today? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that gets right to the nub of the issue, it seems to me. Um, and it's a multifaceted issue. Um, um, well, you say I started 50 years ago. I started the, my veterinary career 50 years ago, uh, but it took me 20 years to properly wake up to the reality that I was living a, or had been living a lie and that uh, the veterinary training was founded on fallacy. The fallacy that uh, stuff in the can, I won't call it food, but stuff in the can or the packet uh, was doing untold harm, but yet being sold as being entirely suitable and safe for the purpose. So that realization didn't arise for me until the late eighties, early nineties. And then within a very short time, I'd say it, it crystallized in 1991-92 and maybe into 93. We got the essence of the whole thing, and that was that carnivores crave to rip and tear and crunch on raw meaty bones. And that was the essence, and that needed to be communicated. At that time, we didn't fully understand the, the full extent of that need, that physicality, but we got a pretty good idea. And following on from that, the chemicals were right, the biochemicals. Because if, if you sorted out the texture problem, the ripping and tearing and chewing to ensure that the teeth and gums got the proper cleaning and that the... the uh, immune system was stimulated because the brain chemicals got stimulated and the stomach acids began to flow in the right proportion. And then the, the pancreatic juices were in the correct proportion, namely not much because most of the food self-dissolved. So that was the starting point way back. And it was as simple as, it was a simple matter of saying to people, just chuck your dog, cat, ferret, whatever, a raw meaty bones, equivalent to the size that they would catch themselves in the wild and you'll be right and that was the starting point alas there was i have to be careful who i name here but i'll name billinghurst he got hold of this idea saw that he couldn't uh trademark it he couldn't package raw meaty bones because it was a generic product and so he put a dreadful spin on the whole thing and and his followers became known as the born again raw feeders, the barfers. And that's where the rot set in, where he and his cohort got dollars in dollar signs in their eyes instead of scientific principles. And so, um, and it was dressed up to be made convenient for people to not offend their sensibilities, their belief that, oh, um, blood and meat and bone is not nice in our nice, pristine living rooms. And so he pandered to that. And this opened the floodgates for opportunists to come out of the hills and the forests and everywhere, and they descended and decided that in order to make the money the power they were after power prestige and profit that was their motivator and it's continued to this day and it's it frankly disgusting because the animals have done nothing to deserve this betrayal and the pet owners deserve better and the people the rest of the people on the planet we all share this planet and we've got to be kind to it and that doesn't entail mincing up 
meat and bits of bone according to a set formula and adding vegetables and bottle supplements in order to make money for the, the greedy few. But what happens then? The followers get duped. And then they become accustomed to this. And then, in fact, because of their pride, they don't like to acknowledge that they've been duped, they've been fooled and made to look stupid. Well, they nobody likes that. And unfortunately, in the course of all of this, the simple, raw, meaty bones, essential truth was suppressed and outlawed. Now, of course, it's outlawed by Mars, Nessa and Colgate and the organized veterinary profession who are out and out serious offenders. But unfortunately, we've got this other protective cordon around the whole toxic edifice and it's made up of raw feeders. And because they attach this name raw to what they soak in on, I call them righteous and wrong because they don't lead with raw meaty bones front and center. They lead with their complicated recipes and formulas and they get so indignant. So I thank you for the question. I hope that that answered it. Yes, thank you. So take us back some. It seems like in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when this all started started solidifying for you, it seems like it started with the dental disease issue. Is that right? Right. That, that was the thing that uh, was so noticeable and so offensive. And when we tumbled to it, and I, I'm proud to say that my first contribution on this I recognize that this was partly physiological and starts with the cutting of the first set of teeth between three and six weeks of age, and then is worsened between four and six months when all the first lot of teeth drop out and the new teeth come through the gums. So this stinking toxic stew starts then. And identifying that was was really a significant step forward. Going beyond that, it was a further step forward to say, hey, this is probably part of the regulatory mechanism to ensure that carnivores don't overrun the food supply. Because if these little neonatal carnivores have stinky breath and bad gums, and if they don't rip and tear and chew pretty quickly, that chronic disease will become established and it won't be long before the little carnivore is dead. Um, and so we saw, I saw, I woke up on Christmas morning in 1992 with this epiphany, this incredible understanding that had come to me in the night um, because I'd melded together information from James Lovelock, fellow of the Royal Society, and Professor Lynn Margulis, who was the... She was the wife of Carl Sagan, the uh, notable astronomer. And um, she's a terrific scientist in her own right, and, and your viewers would be well to go and Google all about her. Um, anyway, I was incredibly lucky to have encountered their teachings and then started to wonder, you know, well, this ubiquitous rotten mouth that all of our carnivores in domestic domestication have wonder what the why the need for that? Why should that be so? Why should they all fall apart in the mouth department? And then extrapolating it to the wild, we realize that, well, actually in the wild, they don't have this problem unless they're in trouble. If they're in trouble not cleaning their teeth, then they're into a downward spiral, which can be arrested, of course, if they got lucky. For instance, um, supposing Mother Wolf is not bringing enough raw meaty bones back into the lair, then all the wolf cubs would start to have stinky breath and, uh, and uh, bad gums. But if suddenly mother wolf got access to a whole lot of young deer, young lambs, fish in the river, whatever, and started to bring them back into the lair, then these wolf, young wolves would heal their mouths and gain strength and go forward. Thinking about this, well, 
the mechanisms are, are huge and fantastic. And it's all about communication, communication between species, communication between bacteria and gums. The bacteria are talking to the gums. The gums are talking to the bacteria. Uh, as a consequence, the gums are also talking to the immune system, to the heart, the liver, and so on. So it's a massive system of interconnectedness where one thing talks to another to another. And then this gets represented in terms of the cybernetic hypothesis of periodontal disease in in mammalian carnivores. And you can see that on the website. It's on this extreme right-hand side of the carousel that goes whizzing across. Um, it, it's, there's different segments, but the last one is about the cybernetic hypothesis. And I believe that uh, in centuries, centuries to come, that will be seen as so hugely significant in terms of what's going on in our carnivores' mouths and then in the rest of their body and how that relates to what the role they used to have as the regulators on our planet during the age of mammals. They're not the regulators anymore because man picked up the club and assumed dominance and then built his skyscrapers and his various systems and the carnivores are pushed out. But actually, if we go back and look at them and look at the mechanisms that maintain them in health, and then in turn, what maintains a healthy ecosystem that they were at the top of, then we start to understand some pretty profound things. And of course, all of that was stamped on by the barfers and the prey modelers and the holistics. It was just crushed. So the important stuff is nowhere to be seen. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's so very true because so many people are afraid of raw feeding, even though they feed raw. And I think it's because although the majority of the community is so positive when it comes to the benefits of this diet, all it takes is a few people to plant seeds of doubt. And um, we're finding ourselves feeding a, you know, a quote unquote, fresh food diet that's filled with synthetic vitamins that doesn't actually have bone, but has bone dust in it. And our dogs very rarely get any type of whole bones because people are afraid that their dog's going to break a tooth or their dog's going to choke, or it's going to be an impaction. And it's, I, I was one too. And that got me into the habit of sitting outside with my dogs when they ate bones and watching how they do it and how they know what to do. Yes. And you've seen that. Mm -hmm. They, you know, and I had, whenever I bring a new dog into the house, I basically just sit on the floor with them and start with a bone that looks like it'll be a good for their size. And I hold on to one end and our last two dogs, they came from kibble, homes into my home and immediately went to raw no problems whatsoever exactly and, right and that's just and it wasn't even my intention to go cold turkey they were like we're going cold turkey and and that really helped to build my confidence in just letting my dogs do what they have to do in one of your videos you talked about um i went on a deep dive on youtube but you talked about how young puppies will attack like whole raw quail without any hesitations because they just instinctively know what to do. Can you speak more about trusting our dogs to know what they need? I'm delighted. Wonderful. So I think you're referring to the YouTube clip where the poodle puppies, and I think they're six weeks of age, uh, and they've come in for their first vaccination and my obligation is to them, first and foremost. The owner thinks that I'm going to vaccinate these puppies and and send them on the way and the job will be done. Well, I'm going to do that because there's an expectation. But the, the main thing is that I need to demonstrate to the owner um, who breeds these little animals and has no real idea that they're modified wolves. I need to demonstrate that to her. So I say to the nurses, right, well, how you, about you go to the, our freezer room and bring us back some quail frames because that's suitable for these this size of of um, carnivore at this stage in their lives and we toss them on the table and there you are you you see their instant uptake 
of this food. This was their first proper meal that they'd ever had in six weeks. They'd never brushed their teeth. They'd never eaten a proper meal. And yet here they were straight into it. And you can see how they attack, attack with gusto straight away. And indeed, generally speaking, with uh, young animals, that's how they will tackle their raw meaty bones first first time up. Uh, for older animals, though, I've got to say, you know, if they've been on the junk food for too long, quite likely they're going to have dental issues. And uh, it just depends the age and also, of course, the, the genetic makeup. I mean, animals with push face like French bulldogs, the, the, the big sort of fashionable breed these days, that, uh, certainly over here and in Australia, they're liable to have uh, bad teeth anyway, just because of the configuration of their jaws. Um, and then if they're a couple of years of age and have never brushed their teeth, because they've never eaten their proper food. Uh, imagine yourself if, if you went, you know, eating slops out of the can or packet and never ever picked up a toothbrush, you'd be in, in trouble. Um, so back to, yes, the, the French Bulldog, the Pug, the Pekingese, um, they, they will tackle the food straight away, but beware, don't just feel that, well, that's enough. Um, you, you really need to be sure that there's no rotten teeth and, and periodontal disease, gum disease, where the jaw bones are being dissolved away by the bacteria, which have been on the planet, getting on for four billion years. They were here first. They know what they're doing and they know how to dissolve living bone. And that's what goes on. Have I said too much? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> so, you know, you've been talking about this issue for the better part of the last 35 years and often at great expense to, you know, your professional reputation and journal articles, you know, back and forth and uh, being expelled from the veterinary society. And what keeps you going? Is it just the pursuit of spreading the truth? Well, what keeps me going? I think bloody mindedness. I think having stumbled across a profound truth about these carnivores and their overwhelming biological imperative to rip and tear and chew, which is, for me, it's, it's a, a limited little concept, but it's incredibly uplifting. It's almost spiritual. Uh, when I just see nature uh, concentrated into just this act of the, the carnivore uh, attacking its prey and, and ripping and tearing and chewing. And it's a magnificent thing to behold. So I, how, how does one know oneself? Why do you keep going against the obstacles? I don't know. But it's incredibly uplifting, as I say. It's intriguing in an intellectual way. Um, it speak, I'm an INTJ, I think it is, according to the... the um, Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs. Myers I'm an ENFJ. <laughs> I don't know what the different categories are, but INTJ, INTJ I think is what I, what I am. Anyway, yeah, a, a bit of a narrow spectrum, um, a bit obsessive probably. But it's good to... it's. Yeah, it, it, it's good to be obsessive about something that's significant. Well, it, it, it should be. It should be. It should completely overturn the current veterinary orthodoxy, upend it completely. If, if indeed we take it to its logical conclusion, it's illegal to be cruel to your cat or dog. But, you know, these big corporations and the veterinary leadership are um, massively cruel. They, they just got a callous indifference to what happens to the animals. And, of course, they then engage in this massive over-servicing when, in fact, to solve most of the problems, just chuck a raw meaty bone on the, on the ground and let the animals self-medicate. So one of the things I really loved about your newest book is that, you know, we hear people who have been interested in raw feeding and in taking 
care of their dogs in a different way from what is conventional. You know, we hear about the advertising industry. We hear about how vet schools have been sort of taken over by the big corporations. And you really lay it out. And I mean, with letters and emails and documentation, and I mean, it, it was like validating to me that I have believed this, you know, wholeheartedly for the last 10 years. And here, I mean, you were just spelling it out like detail after detail after detail. And and I, I think anybody who's interested in learning more about, you know, this issue, like you give like this wonderful history of sort of like how this has all happened. And, and uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Kimberly knows how I, I love digging into the details of all these things. And, and so that was really exciting for me to read. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, look, I there's big slabs of quoted text in there. Um, somebody said, oh, when, when you're writing a history, then you can paraphrase and just say, well, the French went to war against the Prussians in whatever and da 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 and encapsulate the whole maybe 100-year war in, in two lines or sentences. And I thought that wouldn't do because if I paraphrase, then people would say, well, it's just me speaking. So my way around this was just simply absolutely to quote other people in slabs of text. This is what they said, whether it be for or against, and, and let the reader read that. Um, and, well, you'll find that the veterinary regulatory authorities don't come out of this very well at all. Um, the veterinary schools, the BAFAs, the prey modelers, the holistics. Um, now, then you could say, oh, well, you know, I've been selective in my quoting. Well, yes, in order to fit it within the covers of one book. I mean, you know, there's a limit to how much you can put in. But I, you know, that that's accurate. What's in there? Absolutely. And, of course, it's been before the lawyer um, two times at great expense and three editors and... Um, Another top ranking lawyer came back to me just overnight and, and said uh, he was not going to review the book in the Journal of uh, Competition and Consumer Policy uh, in Australia because his journal was a specialist uh, consumer fraud journal, basically, and uh, they didn't have a room for it. But he made some very positive noises about how the book was well he said it was excellent so you know that's a pretty good testimony to the accuracy of this stuff can you share your insight into why is it that some veterinarians are so like stubborn when it comes to like they i have had experiences where I they did there's no science and I will show them here's the science here's a stack of books by doctors saying what I'm saying and still they will turn change the subject go on the defense or go on the attack but they will not address um nutrition with me and I mean do these companies have their hooks in them so hard that they just, I, it's shocking to me that a scientist, which I think veterinarians are, aren't interested in the science. Well, oh, don't forget that veterinarians are people. Um, and people come from a long line of animals that are both predator and prey. So they've got a double dose of cunning. And, but they're a community, they live communally in packs, if you like, and their first loyalty is to the pack or to the community or to the tribe. Uh, and truth, in fact, doesn't really enter into that to a great degree. Uh, once you're initiated into a tribe or group like that then that's where your first loyalty lies because then there's safety in numbers and you're just going to follow on you're not going to be an outlier so um, vets are um motivated large in large part by fear um 
And fear is an acronym for false expectations appearing real. And so they're caught. They're worried. And they've lied because they've, intuitively, they know they've lied because they know that the wolves in the zoo are defined as carnivores. And they've seen the wolves in the zoo ripping and tearing and chewing at whole carcasses. So that's in one compartment in their brain. But the other compartment of their brain has been filled up with all the bullshit from the university where they've been encouraged to believe that the nutrient needs of these animals is all scientifically proven and uh, is suitable and safe. And so that's in their mind. But those self-same veterinarians you've spoken to in a different situation might let their guard down. They tend to compartmentalize. And if they've had a few drinks or whatever and loosen their tongue, they might start to say different things. So that's what you're dealing with. So actually trying to argue with them is not particularly productive activity but getting them in the courtroom and speaking under oath will be and i think some of the foot soldiers are going to need to be in the courtroom and be made examples of which is a bit of a shame for the foot soldiers really it should be the the so-called leaders of the veterinary profession that are arraigned on big charges for deliberately deceiving the community for holding this double standard that the wolves, one side of the the um, fence got to be fed according to nature's design, and the other side of the fence, no, they got to be fed ultra processed junk sold by their sponsors. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's oh well, it's frightening to me that you know when they do food feeding trials. You know, I think back to what was acceptable when I was in college as far as, you know, doing an assignment and proving a point. I don't get to pick and choose my facts and my sources to prove a point. I have to look at the entire picture. But within the pet food industry, if there's an outlier, they can throw that aside and act like it didn't happen just to prove that their food is beneficial. And it's crazy to me that that has become an acceptable practice well number one there's never been any published results where they've tried longitudinal study to have one pen of dogs cats ferrets or whatever fed raw meat bones and the other pen fed their chosen junk um no doubt these trials have been conducted in the junk pet food industry uh, laboratories and and um, and hell holes that they em- employ to test their products. So, so that comparison has never been done. It doesn't need to be done to to prove what we know. By definition, carnivores are eaters of whole carcasses, and, and by observation, they do that. You don't need to run a a long study. In the same way, for instance, uh, by definition, if you stand in front of a a speeding bus, by definition, you're likely to come off the worst for it and might die. Um, And by observation, it's the same. You're never going to do a longitudinal study just to prove that your observations are correct. So, (laughs) right, okay. What, but... So you see that number one with all of this, we have to distrust the so-called science. If their science comes up with such idiot outcomes, then their science is either highly untrustworthy or alternatively the way they've employed their science is untrustworthy. So we have to drill down into this and understand that it's just uh, smoke and mirrors. It's a sham. We we come to believe that science is sacrosanct and, and special. No, it's not. It's nothing of the sort. It's just um, it's the fashion to believe that. But nothing is ever studied in the veterinary, junk pet food, fake animal welfare area 
that's going to in any way call into question their belief systems. So they only ever research stuff that they know what the outcome is going to be. Or if they get an adverse outcome, well, they simply don't publish it. So it's a, a big confidence trick. That's the, and hopefully this new book is designed to explode all of that and just say, look, you can't believe these people. They are just so untrustworthy. So tagging on to what Kimberly was saying about what veterinarians learn in, in vet school and, uh, you know, what their belief system becomes, you had shared a story about, and please forgive me if I mispronounce her name, is it Dr. May Yam? May Yam, yes, yes. So could um, you share that story with us? Well, May is wonderful, and you will see quite a few photos of her on my new website. The old website has just been mothballed, but it's accessible. The new one is all glitzy and a and, uh, company here in London has done that. And you can see pictures of May. You can see her and her team when she took over the, the veterinary clinic in at the end of the introduction, I think it is, of the, of the new book. So what, what's the story? Well, May turned up to do a locum She'd come up from Melbourne. She was a, a new, relatively new graduate. She had two or three full-time jobs. And she then embarked on the, the temporary circuit. So just going into veterinary clinics as a, a locum tenens, holding the fort and so on. She came to work for me. Well, I've had lots of young vets work for me. And you, you can't challenge them too early on in the piece because it upsets them they get their hackles up they they feel that they personally are being challenged um ordinarily it takes about six months to turn a vet's thought process around to be looking in the right direction so that you know they've got to get, travel through 180 degrees from completely wrong to completely right and it takes six months <clears throat> in may's case it took 18 months um but happy to say her conversion was much more solid. She then understood the gravity, the seriousness, the significance of all this and said, hey, this is really, really important. And I'm ready to become my own boss, run my own show, and I'd like to buy your veterinary clinic. And of course, I was past due for retirement and pass due for the opportunity to write this third book. So I leapt at the opportunity. And um, we worked to together very closely ever since. Um, and you can go to her website, Blyde Park Pet Health Center, and see the great work she's doing. So she's just taken this on board. And she's not very old, but uh, the two-year anniversary, I think it was, of her buying the practice, the both of us spoke at the Vet Expo in Sydney's Darling Harbour. And so this was terrific for her, that she made this complete transformation um, and uh, had the courage of her convictions. And, of course, she constantly get, gets constant reinforcement that she's taken the right road. <laughs> you know, she it's not without its challenges, of course, you know, animals are toward the end of their life. They've got a multiplicity of of um, maladies, of course. Um, so mostly they'll turn around and, and become like puppies and kittens again when you pull the teeth out, change the diet. But it it can be trouble. It can be taxing, coaxing animals that are reluctant, coaxing owners who are reluctant. Um, so I really salute her because that's a huge challenge for a, a young person working against the conventional beliefs of her her so-called veterinary profession. Yeah, I really appreciated that. You said it normally takes six months, but it took her 18 months, but then <laughs> she was all in and I, I just, I appreciated that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, so did I, but the 18 months dragged on, I'll tell you. I, it wasn't one <laughs> thing. <laughs> You know, I've shared with Kimberly before, um, I did not grow up having dogs or really having any pets in my life at all until I was 25. And so when we first got a dog, you know, I didn't even know 
that there was an option. I had spent my whole life seeing these commercials for pedigree and for all these things. I mean, it never even occurred to me, you know, I had been so, you know, the consumer, you know, uh, message had come across so strong. And so I think it took probably four or five years uh, of me having a dog before I was exposed to somebody who told me about raw feeding. And I mean, it blew my mind open <laughs> that there was this yeah. whole other alternative. And of course it made complete and total sense, you know, as, as soon as I started looking at it, but, you know, I appreciate how much, you know, going back to the Sprat biscuits, like you, that you really give this history of the marketing and the advertising and the deception of these industries. And uh, I think it's so valuable for everyone to, to read. Mm. Well, good, because that gives them a foundation and, and an understanding where they're at, because we're immersed in this junk pet, pet food propaganda as a consequence of the regulatory authorities not doing their job. There are advertising standards in all Western countries where you're not allowed to blatantly lie, whether it be on the TV, on the radio, or indeed on the internet. Increasingly, you know, Google and, and Meta and Co are supposed to police blatant lying. They need to get after this junk pet food line that's going on apace. Yeah. It, it's seriously bad. Um, and I think, though, uh, one or two people uh, instructing their lawyers is going to make a difference. One or two people contacting the um, the stock exchanges and saying, look, a big company is selling their stocks on through your uh, stock exchange, but it's fraudulent. The stuff they're selling, underpinning their stocks, is poisonous and harmful. Um, do recognize this. And I, I think um, when you only need one or two of these to, to take hold and, um, and be prosecuted, and I think you'll see the beginning of a, a movement and the beginning of a revolution. It's got to start somewhere. Yeah, I think I that it's, it's interesting. I was looking at my old emails I emailed you years and years ago because I wanted to oh. know where 801010 came from. And I was doing all this deep dive research because at the time everyone was like, well, you feed your dogs 801010. And just one day, it was probably my awakening, my second awakening. And the first one was discovering raw feeding. The second was that we were accepting things without really understanding why it just became canon. And so I had, I asked everyone and no one knew where it came from. And I had your book and I was just like, I'm just going to email and see. And you responded right away to tell me it's a scam. It's a fraud. It's not real. And I was just like, it opened my eyes in a way where Sorry. now, whenever I look at anything that's going on with raw feeding, I, I look at it with just clearer eyes. I'm not willing to believe every single thing that comes across every single thing mm -hmm. that people tell me. And I also just remind myself, you know, I know that my dogs are pets. I know that they've evolved and they're all mixed breed mutts in my house. However, their insides haven't changed. And, That's right. you know, they don't need, um, you know, if for some reason this world ended, my dogs would adapt and survive without software, without spreadsheets, without a meal formulator or a nutritionist. I mean, I love learning about dog nutrition. I love learning about the macro and micronutrients and the different way foods interact with each other. But that's my desire to feed my knowledge. It's so unnecessary for my dogs. And, but I just, I was going back to that email and you were just, you were very just blunt. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't sugarcoat it. You just told me, no, this is a scam. Yeah. Everyone has been duped. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that anecdote. And well, I, I stand by those words, sight unseen. I haven't actually seen 
what was written back then. But yes, that's what I believe. I mean, it's a woeful thing that those people did, that they transmogrified from barfers into prey modelers, and then their edict was, and anyone who didn't agree with them was on the outer, and uh, and uh, and they were shamed by these people. Um, dreadful, just dreadful, because, because as you know, simultaneously they were promoting this 80 10 10 nonsense they were suppressing the simple easy raw meaty bones formula so that's one of the reasons why i wrote uh work wonders uh, feed your dog raw meaty bones to counter all the nonsense but then their solution to that was to effectively ban the book they had their discussion groups and previously, they give an acknowledgement to Raw Media Bones Promote Health, the first book. But when this second book came along, which just made them all look completely idiotic and nonsensical, they all turned against it. So again, the simple, easy reader, 120 pages of just essential facts, was effectively banned in the so-called raw feeding community. And of course, the, the junk feeding community would never know about it. So, yeah. so there you are. So it's a conspiracy to maintain their power, prestige, and profit. And I hate them. Don't <laughs> like them one little bit. <laughs> well, you know, I believe it because I've seen this so many times in raw feeding groups. And it's one of the reasons why I don't belong to it, because I feel like with the advent of social media, which is so amazing because it's because of social media that I was able to learn about raw feeding, that I was able to find the resources that I needed here locally. I'm actually um, listening to uh, Work Wonders right now. And in part of it, you talked about, you may need to make room in your garage for freezers. And I was just like, duh, did that. And you were like, maybe a couple. And, and I love that you talk about, you know, basically the benefits of a stand up versus a chest freezer. And you go into so many details that other people, it's very practical things that you need to know details that people aren't covering in these social media discussions. And these are things that people need to know if they're going to embark upon this diet. But what you were saying about the shaming and the, you know, the banning of things, there are groups out there that as in order to join the group, you have to agree not to mention certain people's names not to mention certain websites. You can't share articles or books from any of these type of resources. Um, there are groups where you will get kicked out if you ask the wrong question. I've been in groups where I asked the question about eggs, raw goat's milk, kefir, like all the dairy products that people at the time were starting to really push. It's like, where does that fall into raw feeding? Next thing I know, I was out of the group. They didn't answer it. They didn't tell me. I mean, it was just sort of like, no one wants to have a discussion. They just have decided that this is how we're going to feed. And if you don't get in line, we're just going to shut you down. And this is still happening today where people will, if you ask questions, I, I'm a quest, I have questions. So if someone reads something and they come to a conclusion, I want to know more. But that is so frowned upon because people feel attacked if you ask them questions. And it's just sort of like, aren't we all here to learn? But no, no, we're not. We're yeah. here to monetize a way of feeding. And if you start asking questions, people might rethink buying my services. That's right. And that's that my tin exactly foil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you've got it right. You got it so right. And uh well done you that you've seen the error of their ways and very hard to convince them. Of course, they're all um, self-opinionated and self-styled ex experts in their own minds, but not one of them will have ever uh, pulled a tooth out of a, a dog or a cat. Not one of them has ever had responsibility to advise an owner uh, what's the very level best way for this particular animal? No, th these are all book learning people. And, and these people are writing books. They're a shameful bunch, um, dreadful. And I think they know who they are. Um, I see them as criminals. Criminals. Yeah, well, to suppress the truth and advance the lies is not an appropriate way to conduct ourselves 
in in society i mean why do you want to dupe people in that way but anyway back to your social media yeah look i'm coming to it anew i mean i've been busy running the veterinary clinic and and then writing the book and now i'm in to this publicity phase i'm i'm forced into using facebook uh linkedin twitter and maybe instagram and you because i don't know i'm not comfortable in this space at all but i see that it's necessary anyway just the other day i established a new group on linkedin it's called the pet food con and i would encourage everyone to go there pardon and we're, and we're going to join everyone... right now <laughs> I know, exactly. yeah, please do please do and let's have some fun there but um, today, just this morning, I published the open letter to the junk pet food industry and their enablers. And, it, and um, my publicist recommended, look, you know, you really got to establish where you stand with this whole thing. So write an open letter and let the, um, the pet food industry know what their responsibilities are. And so I published that today on all the linkedin facebook and twitter and but we will have the good robust discussion i hope on this small group that's only been in existence for about three days maybe four so welcome if you would like to join yes we'll make sure we have a link in the show notes for everyone yes. to join also <laughs> give me a reason to use linkedin <laughs> i really well this to. well i i avoided it for all these years and you know because I, I didn't particularly want to talk to people or be accessed <laughs> but, well I understand <laughs> I can relate but I've now seen that they have groups and I'm not so I joined some veterinary groups but I was banned from one of them by the way the, <laughs> um, so you could go in there and uh, and join that group it's the veterinary managers group or something i can't remember exactly but i was on there and i i put a couple of posts on and then the next i knew that i couldn't post and and that i was off of there and so i tried to resubscribe to that group and no they were not having me they were not going to have any discussion about uh, the need for carnivores to rip and tear and chew oh no <laughs> So one thing I, we're having any discussion about pet food, I think we have to touch on is the obesity epidemic yes. as well. And, um, you know, there was an article uh, about people health that I read a few months ago that was basically saying that hunger and obesity are the same problem because it's all stemming from sugar and refined starch. So even amongst people, we have people who are obese, but they're starved for nutrients because nothing they're eating has any kind of nutrition in it. And I think like we're seeing that amongst our pets and ourselves, quite frankly. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I agree. Uh, um, just what all the mechanisms are, I'm, I'm not sure. But certainly obesity is these days held to really influence the immune system. And uh, then in turn, that ad adverse effect on the immune system has an adverse effect on the gums. And all of these things are inter interdependent. Uh, but in the new book, um, Okay, it, in the previous two books, I didn't talk much about obesity, but in this new one, I, I thought, no, 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 we, we, we got to address that. And we've had so much experience just resolving the, the obesity issue with animals that you just simply fill in the, the little questionnaire thing that we have in, I don't know, whatever page of the book. And it tells you what to do. You just keep animals a bit hungry, um, in the case of a fat dog, feed it every couple of days or sometimes every third day. Um, pussy cats, you've got to be a bit more careful with them. But um, this is this can be resolved relatively easily with cats and dogs. They're different to humans and, and uh, as long as you feed them the appropriate nutrients, you won't get imbalances and you won't have a problem. And you can just keep them hungry and away they go. Now, it, it's conceivable that uh, dogs and cats with um, hypothyroidism, for instance, um, could 
end up getting fat because of some hormonal imbalance and so on, I've yet to encounter it. Uh, so just, just read the obesity section in the book, follow that, and away you go. Um, I, I cite one example in there where somebody brought me a fat uh, cock spaniel with a chicken bone stuck between its upper lips and lower lips. So it was in the side of its mouth there, couldn't properly close its jaws. And it got that from the garbage, scavenging in the garbage. And so to get it out, we had to anesthetize the dog, which we did, um, pulled out the bone, cleaned up the teeth, remarked to the owner that the dog was considerably overweight and better to limit its food intake. So go a couple of days, no food, and then feed and so on, and feed raw meaty bones, not the canned and whatever junk previously feeding. When the dog came back for a checkup a week or two weeks later, I was fully expecting the owner to say, oh, my dog's really ravenous now because you've made me fast my dog um, and, and this is not good and so on. And as a consequence, the dog is raiding the kitchen bin more so than it was previously. That's what I expected to hear. But it was just the other way around. The dog was contented. It didn't need to go near the kitchen bin because it was getting all that it needed through its raw meaty bones. It was losing weight, but that was fine as far as the dog was concerned too. It was not, it was satiated with the proper food and didn't know, need to go scavenging. So that to me, of course it's anecdotal, but it indicates to me that these animals on the canned and the dry stuff are definitely not getting what they need their physiology tells them that and they go scavenging for more and if that more happens to be more kibble rain based or if it happens to be more bread or pasta or rice or whatever then of course they're going to get fat because uh, refined carbohydrates turn to glucose and then glucose goes off into the cells and gets laid down as as fat so that's what's going on and along the way if you're a cat you probably get the diabetes as well as well as the dehydration Don't be a cat Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So while we have you here, for anybody who is fearful of doing bones, because whether it's coming from their, you know, I've had veterinarians tell me like, oh, I've heard these horror stories, you know, that they've removed obstructions or that they, you know, they have their anecdotal reasons why they tell people to avoid bones. Can you give somebody who's on the fence about trying this some guidelines for selecting appropriate bones for their dog? Okay, well, it's probably about reconceptualizing. Uh, so they're on the fence because they're confused, because they've got a whole lot of different ideas swirling around in their heads. So the best thing to do is get rid of all these aberrant thoughts that have been implanted there by a lifetime of being uh, brainwashed by, through the TV and, and the raw feeding groups and so on. So they've been left in a jittery state of nervous anxiety. Um, so they've got to just calm down. They're on the fence. I grant you that. But they've got to try and clear their minds, start again. Then, ideally, what they'll do, they'll resolve to go to my website because there's lots of information there. And then, and they're just going about this in a, a systematic way. And then they say to themselves, right, there's a lot of information there, but really I need a book that I can take with me, or in your case, through your earplugs. And it's called Work Wonders, Feed Your Dog. And the same applies, feed your cat or ferret, raw meaty bones. The same rules apply. So you go and digest that book. You, you ingest it and digest it and understand more about what you're doing because it's very good to have some theory and then you start to be on firm ground. Don't forget that Mei Yam, Dr. Mei Yam, with five years of veterinary training, took her 18 months to fully understand and make the, the change. So the fence sitters out there who are worried about this, you know, take it easy on yourself. Understand how you came to be a fence sitter. 
understand that you've been exposed to a whole lot of indoctrination and that's a great shame and now you're left on your own trying to fathom away and like i say clear your head get rid of that information whether it came from buffers or prey modelers or mars or nestle or colgate or any of them because then none of them are reliable none of them and then of course the other component to this is understand that for the carnivores the food and medicine are one and the same they don't have labels they don't say this is food and this is medicine it has the same function and it starts with the ripping and tearing and chewing that stimulates the the brain chemicals the endorphins which then stimulate the immune system and at the same time the salivary flow starts and then they clean their teeth and so all of these things hang together and these are all fairly much medicinal functions. And I think it's in chapter four of uh, multi-dollar, multi-billion dollar pet food fraud. You can read all about that. So you understand that this is a medicinal function. And once you understand it's medicinal, you understand that um, accessing it, sourcing it, purchasing it, storing it, administering this medicine is quite a, an important function and you need to know how to deal with that and so the medicine raw meat bones doesn't come with packaging with instructions on so you get those instructions elsewhere and also of course you go and look at the um, youtube videos and again these moving images um they don't lie they tell you the truth and so that's what we need to do to give people confidence in due course i think owning a carnival is going to be seen as a privilege and that you're going to need some education uh you know they're, they're very specialist organ organisms the sentient creatures and people are encouraged to see them as as furry toys with little in the way of management and 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 um, maintenance needs but they're not fairy toys they're sentient creatures and primarily they need something to rip and tear and chew the physicality of the food and then the nutrients follow on from that because if they rip and tear and chew at the right raw meat bones the good medicine then the nutrients that travel on down and they don't need to worry about that so we we've understood all of this you know i'm constantly looking for chinks in my armor where i've got it wrong or i've missed out something or failed to take account for sufficient and so on there is nothing it's 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 all there it's just laid out um for everybody to go and see in the trilogy so i say the three books are a trilogy you start off with the science in raw midi bones and then the easy reader practical know-how in work wonders and then um we get into the corruption in the third book um with a more expanded statement on what to do so there you go there's, there's a lot to this of course there is at the beginning of any revolution there's masses of information that needs to be disseminated to a dependent public and their dependent animals well we'll make that's sure what that i say <laughs> we'll make sure we have links for everybody in the show notes so that they can get all that get the trilogy <laughs> They can get all of them. What? I beg your pardon, Erin. So that they can get your trilogy. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Well, they should go. And now, then, each of the three books is not available as an ebook at the moment. We had technical upload issues, and so they all had to be taken down. And they'll be going back up <clears throat> in the coming days. But each of the three is available in paperback in a new edition with a new cover. In the case of the first two, and. Uh, Audio books are available, narrated by me, would you believe? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm listening to Work Wonders now. It's fantastic. I listen to it as I'm walking the dogs, and I love it because it's, it, it's one of those books where now after 10 years of raw feeding, I'm like, yeah, this is what we need to be talking about because this is this is these are the questions that people have, but they get so overwhelmed with all of these other answers that take them away from these questions that this is the book to have. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's easy. You know, you don't even have to read it. You can listen to it these yes. days, which is, you know, an, an advance over the way things were. So terrific. I'm delighted that you've picked that up and <laughs> you're going well. Going well. I love it. Good. Right. <laughs> Well, we don't want to keep you yeah. much longer. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to get to speak with you today. We're very thankful for your time. Thank you so much. Well, it's special. I've enjoyed it immensely. It's the first one. And um, I thank you wholeheartedly. It's been a terrific experience. <laughs> I look forward to the next time. Yes, you me too. <laughs> oh, we would love that. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs>